Welcome to Urbanism Vancouver, a podcast that explores how our built environment shapes our everyday lives and community experiences. I'm your host, Helen Loy. Join me as we discover where we live, work, and play, and how we can shape better communities. With each episode, we'll bring a bit of insight and industry experience for myself and my guests. We'll dive into the inner workings of our urban surroundings and explore how places are planned, designed, and built, and discuss ways to create more livable, equitable, and sustainable cities. I hope that you'll learn a little and be inspired to be more curious and more involved in impacting positive change. Before we get started today, we want to acknowledge that this podcast is recorded and produced on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and recognize the enduring connection they have to this land. We strive to have our conversations contribute towards reconciliation and work towards sustainability and equity for all the custodians of the lands. We've spent a lot of our episodes to date diving deep into the complexities of our urban surroundings. But the biggest part of our potential to impact our future lies with the next generation. So who better to chat with than our up and coming urban residents? Joining me today are three university students who have already begun to shape their vision and impact on the future of our cities. First, I chat with Fern Hahn, a transit advocate, planning student, graphic designer, and creator of assorted urban content. I'm an urban planning student. I'm in my second year of university here in Toronto, but I grew up in a few places around the U.S., mostly in Oakland, California, but pretty consistently in like pretty suburban environments. So my exposure to transit was quite limited growing up. In Oakland, I lived kind of at the edge of the city, so I didn't have much access to transit while I was living there. It was basically just in walking distance. I had a commuter bus that just ran into and out of the the city, like peak direction only a few times a day. So I mostly came to rely on an e-bike that I was fortunate enough to get in high school that would get me down into town proper. And then I could use transit to get around once there. But yeah, I think that that really shaped my perspective on transit a little bit in terms of just the importance of coverage and Mm -hmm. just from from that frustration of of living someplace not served yeah i i also grew up in in a suburb called north delta here in the lower mainland in bc and i remember growing up the first thing i wanted to do after saving up from a part-time job was like to get a car and to me that was like a sense of this means freedom And it wasn't until much later, having gone to university, having visited some places, that I realized, oh, wow, like great public transportation is a real thing that we should strive for. And it's like a much better option. So I wonder, how did it come about for you realizing that it could be better or that it's something that we should we should improve? That's a good question. I think I should start with that. I've always been interested in like passenger transport more broadly from like Mm. a systems perspective. So it's, I've already been thinking about that, right? But I think transit specifically started to interest me when I, in like the earlier part of high school, I briefly lived in a part of the neighboring city of Berkeley that had more access to transit, among other things. And that is like the first time that I had a taste of independence and mobility. And moving back to where I mostly grew up in in Oakland, was kind of a shock after having that exposure. So yeah, I became frustrated at the fact that, you know, some places you can access and some places you could just can't if you don't drive. And I, I don't think that makes any sense. So out of that frustration, I started to think about the topic more and I started to realize how important it is. For young adults like Fern, public transit is the key means of accessing places outside of their immediate neighborhood. When transit systems are poorly funded and lacking, 
This negatively impacts their ability to get to their daily needs, such as furthering their education or seeking career opportunities. I asked Fern how they began to get involved in advocating for better transit. I would often just show up to public meetings and voice my opinion. And I would, in my free time during high school, I explored a lot of the region and just to get acquainted with the state of transit because I I thought it was interesting and important to understand. I would just go places sometimes using transit, even if it meant relying on some services that you know, are are hard to use. How did you go about learning about this? Like, did you just kind of find out online or were there social media things you were following? How did you get involved in even knowing where public meetings were held so that you can provide feedback? I would say it was mostly online. I should mention actually that my mother is an urban planner. So I've been, I've had some exposure to the fields, but I didn't really become interested and involved until I started actually watching some of the popular, you know, urbanism transit content creators that have become kind of an ecosystem recently on on YouTube. And I also became active on Twitter and started talking with people there. And that's what introduced me to this world in more depth. And I think that's when I began to become involved. When you were participating in some of these public meetings, Were there any trends you were noticing in terms of the decisions that they were making? Were they very innovative in terms of planning for the future of public transportation? It's hard to say. I mean, I would would say generally, no. It, It was frustrating often trying to get my point across because it would often feel as though the people in charge, whoever they were, had made their mind up already on how to proceed. And these meetings often just felt like a checkbox to move forward. Could you maybe tell us a bit about the composition of some of those meetings? Were there a lot of people in attendance? Were there a lot of younger people? Did any of your friends go with you to these meetings or mostly was it just a thing that you were doing? This was mostly occurring like during the early part of the pandemic. So it Mm. was basically all virtual, which I think helped me get involved because, you know, that removes a barrier to participating. But I don't think that most of the people there were like me. I mean, it it also depended on the the specific meeting. But um, as is pretty commonplace in this kind of meeting, they're often held at inconvenient times for people. And so it ends up being the people with the time and the resources and the energy generally, and just people who know that this is happening and that this is something that they can voice their opinion on that end up showing up. And that that group of people doesn't usually end up representing the greater population. I saw from your website that one of the things that you you like to do is kind of draw up transit map and different graphics of these different systems. What kind of motivated that? And what are some of like the key differences that you would say is the way that you kind of do your designs versus, you know, some of the ones that are publicly available? The first map that I made was a fantasy map of rail transit for the Bay Area. And that kind of map is what I really started with. I made one for Greater Vancouver, as it happens, among other places. And it was just a fun activity for me because it basically consists of like maximalist armchair transit planning. And it was a way for me also to get acquainted with cities I was interested in just by by studying them and looking at where lines could go, even if I don't necessarily agree with my methodology of doing that anymore. But I think that the maps themselves were a medium for me to do that broader practice. But since then, I've that's grown into an interest in other things like signage and wayfinding and graphic design more broadly. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by network design? Is that basically just kind of how you go about planning kind of expansion of a network? What I mean by network design is, yeah, just like transit planning at the broader level of how rail and bus routes interact to form a network, right? And I feel that sometimes the 
the most common focus when people are discussing where they think a service should go is often quite point to point or like land use oriented, which is certainly part of the puzzle. But I also think that it's more complicated than that. There are a lot of factors that obviously I'm not I'm not an expert, but there's a lot that goes into creating a transit network that serves a diverse variety of trips. Can you give me a couple examples of diverse like so you're saying most of the most of the people who work on these networks are planning kind of like point to point, but what are the other kind of trips that you don't feel they're currently kind of considering as much of? I guess what I mean is that you can't possibly account for every pair of starting point and destination. And it's important then to start from the assumption that people are going roughly from anywhere to anywhere and design the system in a way that is that allows for that and that is optimized for that. Obviously, you can identify core nodes and activity centers. You plan around that, but you also can't assume that people are only traveling between such locations. People also have other places to go. Fern has highlighted that a key issue with the way our transit networks are often planned is that they are trying to plan for all of the riders' point-to-point trips. These may often include assumptions about where those points or nodes exist. Fern then explains proposed changes that could benefit riders, taking into account the variety of transit services. They also use Metro Vancouver's SkyTrain network as an example. I do think that it is very much connecting nodes and centers of the region. I think as like the top layer of the network, like the the most, the the fastest and highest capacity mode within the Translate network, it's probably fine for that to be the case. And also it's worth noting the influence that the SkyTrain itself has had on creating those spatial patterns. It's in the name of Metrotown, for example. It Right. I, I mean, it, it was a mall, but like that is the development there has been spurred by the availability of SkyTrain service, similar with Brentwood, et cetera. So I think that especially when you have a smaller rail system, it's probably OK to prioritize that kind of trip and let the buses do fill in the gaps. Right. In terms of a rail network that would allow you to get between a variety of places. I I mean, I think most of the large transit cities out there would qualify for something like that. I'm thinking Paris or Tokyo or any number of the large Chinese cities, I I think I think would qualify. But again, it's a matter of scale, right? Like not all cities are going to have the resources for or the need for a rail system of that scale. And so it's smart to look at all the tools in the toolbox and see what buses can do and what rail can do and apply your resources accordingly. I think when we were talking to Dennis Agar recently, one thing he mentioned was rail always attracts the most attention and buses do a lot of really important work, but they don't get as much glory, I guess, for for the amount of people that they move. What are your thoughts kind of on that? And I guess even in your experience of now being in Toronto, do you do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's a hurdle that needs to be addressed and worked on. Because again, com- coming from Toronto, as you said, like the TTC, which is our transit system here, is heavily dependent on the bus network, the frequent bus network feeding the subway. And that's really what has allowed the system to be as successful as it is. Because without the buses, you could only go as far as the trains do. And that's not as far as people are going, right? And I think to a a smaller extent, Vancouver is successful at the same thing. If you look at especially the rapid bus network that's been developed and comes to mind as that allows you to get places the SkyTrain doesn't doesn't get you in a pretty fast, convenient manner. But I think from the point of view of like the transit service provider, It's imperative to give bus riders the respect and dignity that you would give your rail riders, both in terms of service quality, like frequency and and service span, but also in terms of the integration of that service with rail services and in terms of amenities too, just making sure that people have a nice place to wait, uh, that the buses are comfortable and 
have enough capacity for the number of people writing, etc. And I think that's not always the case, because as you said, there is this pattern of rail getting all, all the attention. And I think that unfortunately, that is sometimes as pervasive within agencies and within spaces where people are actually calling the shots as it is in the public. And they probably contribute to each other in a way. Mm, I'd be really curious to know of the people who work at some of these agencies, how many of them are using like both, you know, say train as well as buses on a regular basis, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. Because I, I think even just among people I know, a lot of people will say, yeah, I take this guy train all the time. But then a lot of people kind of draw that line at like, I take public transportation, meaning SkyTrain, but I don't take buses. Right. I think another part that I might add is the legibility of buses. I think a, a rail system is kind of by nature easier to parse usually and understand as a new rider than many bus systems are often because they're smaller, right? Like there are just fewer lines and fewer stops, but also because I find they're often more deliberately signed and routes are simpler and more clearly identified. And that's not necessarily true of bus systems, unfortunately. And I think that, you know, there are steps that you can take towards addressing that right, by simplifying both the service itself and also the signage that decodes it. I've never thought about it that way, but I, I, I agree. I mean, SkyTrain as an example, when you get into a station, it's always really clear what stop you're at in relation to the rest of the line, kind of which direction you're meant to go if you're trying to get to a particular spot. Whereas a lot of bus stops, it's just like, here's the number and the name of the bus with no further information as to, like, where does it take you? Where are the other stops along the way? Exactly. Yeah. So what are some ways we can kind of improve that and hopefully make it easier for people to access the bus network? I think the first step is, and this only applies in some cases, but simplifying the network itself is important in my opinion. I mean, obviously, you don't want to sacrifice important coverage or a, you don't want to cut service to a place just because it's hard to understand. That doesn't make sense necessarily. But there are measures that you can take to make sure, for example, that a straight corridor is just served by a single service. And you just know that, you know, this street, this bus runs on this street, for example. And I, I think that especially in a, in a grid city like Vancouver, that's easy enough to achieve. And to an extent, I think Vancouver has that part pretty much covered because I think that's how the system already behaves. And I think one step beyond that is then when you get into signage, right? Like what you were saying, when you're at a bus stop, what information is presented to you? And both on the ground as well as dynamic signage like screens at bus stops and within buses, how well are transfers communicated, things like that. So with a bus line, for example, there are so many stops compared to, say, a SkyTrain that, you know, maybe has 10, 15, 20 stops at most. Are there places that have done bus maps or graphics really well, where it's like a lot of information, but it's able to be read easily and accessed easily, kind of on the ground? It just seems like a lot of information for like how many stops buses have to go, right? I think at least in, in North America, the trend in terms of bus system maps, overview maps, is not to show stops at all. And there's kind of an assumption that a bus, like you just draw the route and indicate what streets it runs along. And there's an assumption that a bus will stop every few hundred meters. Because in North America, bus stops are usually closer together than they are in other parts of the world. And so that assumption is one that you can make and is also useful in terms of decluttering the map of a system this complex, right? So the number of stops doesn't usually come into play at that scale, but it can when you're talking about certain services like express rapid buses that, that stop fewer times, or when you're just talking about a single line, say you're just at a stop that is served by a line, you could 
have a list of stops there. Or when you're on board a bus, it's useful to have dynamic screen that will tell you what the next few stops are, right? It depends on the context, I think, how you show stops and whether you do or not. I think consistency and service nomenclature is really important just to make sure that the system is consistent to itself, right? Like yeah. If you if you see an R, for example, that always indicates that it's a rapid bus and vice versa, that if it's a rapid bus, it's always indicated that way. My understanding is that Vancouver is moving in that direction. I think I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I believe that all the all the new rapid buses that are coming online are buses like rapid buses instead of the, the B lines, the 90s, which have been mostly phased out. I think the 99 is the only one remaining, and I'm not sure why it's still like that. As Fern has pointed out, the bus network could benefit from a variety of improvements, both in their network design, but also in their signage to ensure greater accessibility for all users. Buses serve an important role in connecting key nodes in our communities. I enjoyed learning about network design from Fern and was inspired by their interest and curiosity about public transportation. Next, I speak with two members of the UBC Capacity Club a student-led initiative at the University of British Columbia that aims to bring together undergraduate students interested in urban planning and its various branches. My name is Matthew. I am the co-president of UBC Capacity. I'm a third-year student at UBC studying international relations and urban studies. I joined UBC Capacity. This is my third year in the club. I joined in 2021 when I was in first year as an events coordinator. UBC Capacity really appealed to me because the club itself was focused on urban planning, which has been something I've always been interested in as a kid. And being a first year at UBC, I really wanted to find somewhere where I felt I could flourish, belong, et cetera, et cetera. And the club was a great fit for me. We started off online and now the last couple of years, we've been doing events in person, which is great. And it's really exciting to be a part of this club because we are continuously putting on events for the wider UBC community that pertain to urban studies. And it's been a great last three years. My name is Emma Kneel. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the current director of engagement and partnerships with UBC Capacity. I've been involved with the club for the last two years now, but at UBC, I am currently studying environment and sustainability in the undergraduate geography program. And I also have a major or a minor in geographic information systems and geographic computation. I was born and raised here in the Metro Vancouver area. But until starting my chosen path of study at UBC, I didn't really know much about urbanism and urban planning. But once I took a geography class centered around, you know, the history of Vancouver and, you know, the processes of shaping a city. Um, that really sparked my passion for urban issues. I actually do not know what the acronym stands for, so it would probably be a good, good time <laughs> to, to explain. <laughs> yeah, so capacity stands for creative and passionate about cities. That's a great acronym. Can you maybe just highlight some of the events that you put on in terms of what kind of events do you have and what kind of other faculties perhaps do you have participation from? I think the cool thing about our club is that we actually existed before the program existed. So the urban studies major, which is a major collaborated between the Department of Geography and the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Applied Science, now come together to form the urban studies major, which is in its first year. I'm a part of it. It's very exciting. We've always put on events that try to cater to the entire UBC community, not just a specific department or a specific faculty, et cetera, et cetera. Capacity is very interesting in that regard, and we hold events pertaining to all different types of urban planning. So we've actually had, this year alone, we've had urban studies info nights, we've had career nights, we've had, we're having design challenges, we've had trivia nights, we've had GIS workshops in the past, transit challenges where it's an amazing race kind of style and you have to go around uh, filling up a bingo card with attractions around Vancouver using only transit. So we've really done a lot and the club, you know, we continue to go to new heights every year. We're a relatively new club, so we try to explore as much as we can. But our main principle is always that we really just want anyone who's interested in the field of urban planning to really just take a look and, you know, come to our events and just check it out. And hopefully you can maybe spark a passion for it yourself. Yeah, we certainly have a ton of people from different backgrounds and majors that are 
on our executive team and come out to our events like engineering and business, sciences, forestry even. So I think it's really cool in that regard to see how interdisciplinary urban planning can be. One event that was really successful and something kind of new that we are doing this year. Back in November, we hosted an information session with Dennis Agar, who's actually on this podcast. Um, But he founded the Metro Vancouver Transit Riders Union, also known as Movement. But we kind of use this opportunity to engage our club members and the rest of the UBC community with urban planning issues surrounding transit. And we also use the opportunity to give them a voice to voice their opinions on what they want to see for Vancouver's transit system and spark change in our transit system as well. I think transit's like a really large concern for the UBC community. I know that around half of the daily commutes to UBC are through transit. And so we kind of helped Dennis launch his Fix the 49 movement. And the 49 is definitely a heavily used route by the UBC community, and it has a ton of problems surrounding delays and overcrowdedness. That sounds like a lot of fun. I like the bingo one. That sounds like, like a amazing race style kind of challenge <laughs> that I would love to participate in. So how does capacity as a club kind of foster that inclusive and kind of welcoming environment where people from different faculties can feel like they can access the discussion, whether it's about urban planning or about transit or or that sort of thing when you have people who maybe specialize, right, that in that kind of study? I think the interesting thing about capacity is we really try to provide an intro basis for people to come to the world of urban planning, introduce it to them through all of our events, and just try to like, you know, spark a passion, perhaps. Uh, We have many ways of communicating urban planning related things to our members and to anyone interested. Our comms team has a newsletter they send out every month, which includes lots of urban planning opportunities, including workshops, town halls. It also includes job opportunities in the urban planning field. So there's lots of ways that we try to get people involved. I think the the interesting thing, as I mentioned, is that capacity has really existed before the urban planning, like the urban studies program, which gives us a lot of leeway to kind of drive our own path, if that makes sense. And, you know, take urban planning the way we want to, because we've always had a way of doing things. And obviously, we've worked with the urban studies program, which is a great program. But the thing about capacity is that we really try to foster that love or that interest in urban studies. And we try to do that through like a multitude of our events. But I would say that the best way we get people involved is just trying to advocate for and trying to relate to the urban to like the UBC community in any way we can advocating for things like movement, which is very relevant to UBC students, because you know, a lot of UBC students take the 49 take other buses as well that have congestion. So we try to relate in that facet as well. And then we take that and you know, try to connect those things to urban planning or other facets of urban studies in any sort of way. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the perspectives that come into the discussions when you guys do have events, right? So I think for a topic like transit and movement, it's it's very almost like a no-brainer, right? Like I couldn't imagine why any student who has ever taken transit would ever think, oh, I wouldn't want to support better infrastructure for transit. But then there are also urban issues that are a little bit more tricky, right? When it comes to densification, how tall should buildings be? How dense should places be? And kind of where should that go? So do you find that among your among your club or even when you're engaging with other students on campus at some of these event days that there's different voices and that there's like a bit of engagement and discussion around different views when it comes to some of these urban planning issues? I think one of the interesting things about urban studies is that it incorporates so many things that you would never expect to be incorporated or not even unexpected, but rather it's just such a large field that can overlap with so many other fields of study like sociology, indigenous relations, all of these things, political science, international relations. Urban places are really just an interesting field in our urban planning, should I say, is just an interesting field in that regard. We did have an event last year. It was we it was actually in collaboration with another club at UBC, the UBC Debate Society. And it was basically an election debate. As you know, the municipal election happened last year. 
uh, we hosted a bunch of city council candidates at the UBC AMS Nest and basically had them talk about the future of housing in Vancouver and development and all of those things. So that was a place where I really felt that opinions kind of started to clash. But I think the interesting thing about our club is that we've always historically been a club that really just tries to inform the UBC community about urban events, urban issues, urban planning as a whole. But we never really, our, that event was really our first event where we tried to branch into the more town hall discourse based event where people are free to share their opinions. And I think a lot of people that, I mean, I think we had about 90 attendees. And I think it was a really great opportunity for people just to learn more about the place they live in, but also about how do these things connect to urban planning and how do they also connect from urban planning to other things as well. Because the thing about urban planning, as I mentioned before, is that it's so interdisciplinary that you can connect it to so many different things. And when you go down a rabbit hole, you can you realize that all these things are really connected. And I think that event really showed that. So I think that was a really interesting experience for me. And Definitely like my first time up being a part of the club where I really saw those kind of, you know, discourse based things happening at a club event. The town hall format is particularly interesting. And I think that's the one that, at least in my experience in the industry, that's most common is like you have dissenting voices and then and then people are kind of like, offering their viewpoints and kind of trying to impress upon the general public, right? And ultimately, when you say, when you bring up elections, that's that's so important because whatever information you do get out to the students or to the general public, that is what people will use to inform their decisions that then go into a vote or go into something that then decides the direction, right, that cities are going towards. Do you guys follow along with any other I know UBC is its own like special riding and it has its own voting kind of process, but do you guys follow that or follow other kind of general election updates with within Metro Vancouver or even BC? Yeah, when an election does happen, I do tend to focus or look into the parties and what their big solutions are around densification and the housing crisis, as well as, you know, environmental issues. That does play a big part in who I decide to vote for in an election. I I try to keep myself informed as much as I can. And I think that really helps me think about Vancouver differently because urban planning in Vancouver is very unique just given the the situation we are in with mountains to the north, the sea to the west, the sea to the south as well. We only really have out east to go. And I think even just paying attention to it really just helps you get a better grasp on how urban planning can continue in Vancouver, how it changes, and how it ultimately, like the people who have the power to make decisions can ultimately impact how urban planning is perceived or how it's conducted in Vancouver. And I think just like even knowing about it really just teaches you a lot about how you can think about these things going forward. How do you feel about the level of engagement that is currently being done with the public in general, I guess, as a field of urban planning? Like, what what are you seeing? Do you think it's a it's a sufficient or good level of engagement? You, you would have to dig a little deeper to actually find some of that, at least pertaining to urban planning. I think Dennis has a really like his movement has really tried to facilitate engagement with MLAs and I believe he had a meet. He he posted something on social media, which was about a meeting with an official and talked about the forty nine transit in general. And I think those are great ways to get involved and just do things that can really engage the public. But I would say it's not like at least transportation. At least is not the forefront of political discussion. I think a lot of that is focused on the housing crisis, especially in Vancouver. Jumping on Matthew's mention of movement. I think they're doing such a great job of bringing the public and informing them about p- urban planning issues that we might not know of, might not known otherwise. But I think there's very similar organizations doing the same thing. I think neighborhood associations are a great way for the community to, you know, join together and educate themselves about urban planning issues. I think that there is a bit like of a knowledge barrier for the general public to fully understand urban planning proposals and practices that are going on. 
I know that there's even City Hive is a great example. They put on programs for the youth and public to learn how to engage politically in those urban planning discussions. So I think those are all really powerful tools to get people more involved. And that just brings up another thought. Last year, we actually held an event with campus and community planning at UBC. And they have something called Campus Vision 2050, which is basically a 50, I'm not sure if it's a 50 year plan, I think it's a 30 year plan. But it's a long term plan to basically have campus redeveloped to include more housing, more recreational space, all of these things that are, you know, there's things in progress right now. But we've held engagements with them. And I think that in particular is very relevant to UBC students. And we've tried our best as a club to get involved with that as much as possible, just to, you know, advocate for things that we believe can really help campus. And Campus and Community Planning does great work. And we've worked with them, again, like I mentioned, on multiple occasions to really facilitate that engagement and using our outreach as a club and just our ability, because the Campus and Community Planning isn't a club. They have only, only have so much outreach they can do through their channels. So we have a channel as an AMS club where we're able to reach out to, you know, maybe more of the student body and try to get them engaged as well. And bringing those two together, getting more students involved, that can really help just facilitate discourse on things that are relevant to students and people who live here. That's great. And you guys have a really unique opportunity, again, because UBC being its own little kind of like city almost or municipality, you have a small area where you can have great influence on on the area, right? So I'm glad you guys are having that connection and creating that impact. I guess for someone who might be a student who doesn't know about capacity or even just someone kind of in your age group that doesn't have any prior knowledge about urban planning, what's the like elevator spit pitch that you would give for why people should care, why people should learn and why they should get involved? I mean, that's the big question, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a city is a direct reflection of the people who live in it. And as a young person living in this city, I see many urban issues that especially impact youth, housing affordability, transportation congestion, social inequity. And through urban planning, what I've realized is this is our opportunity to like shape our collective future, not just for our generation, but for generations that are to come. And Urban planning decisions have long-term impact, so I think it's really important that those decisions cater to our needs and what we want to see in a city. In terms of an elevator pitch for urban planning as a whole, I would just say it really helps to, you know, educate yourself on these things because it ultimately affects you, especially if you live in a space where you're going to be involved in these urban places and all of these things. And as Emma said, like there's lots of issues that go on in every city. There's no city's perfect. And there's always something to look at, always something to fix, and just being educated about these kind of things and making an effort to just learn and at least like being able to understand why things exist way- the way they do can really help you just as a as a individual just be able to understand urban processes better. And facilitating the youth is really important too, especially because the youth, all, like our generation will ultimately inherit all these problems that... The generation right now might be leading or whatever you want to call it. And so on that note, then, how how many of your friends and peers and the people around you would you say have like really soaked up all of this from, you know, just interacting with you, I guess? I think it's really interesting. I mean, in terms of my family, family discussions over dinner, we always get into like the political sphere about, I mean, it's typical. I mean, what happens in urban planning and there is quite a large debate around it, at least in my family and my parents, for sure. As like, even when I speak to people of their generation, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to hear about this. I don't really wish to be educated. But yeah, people in my social circles, I mean, especially in capacity, people get involved left, right and center. One of our directors just went to the city of Richmond to advocate for the better location of a bus loop in Steveston, which is amazing. And I know people last year go to city of Vancouver to advocate for housing issues. So even my friends, you know, they love to come out and support capacity events 
in any way they can because their exposure to me talking about these issues has really encouraged them to come out and get more involved in those things. So yeah, I think there's a big age gap there with how much people want to get involved in urban planning. And, you know, it makes me feel encouraged to keep going because, you know, our generation does see an importance in it. Having discussed the impact of being involved in capacity so far, I then asked Emma and Matthew about their career aspirations. There's so many different routes to go down in urban planning. I haven't quite figured out what I wanted to be doing yet. My past career experience has always been in like government, so I've held internship positions in like all three levels, and I do quite like the government side of it. It, it can be a very you know lengthy process in getting things done, at least in the urban planning sphere, as, you know, we all know. But I really like, you know, kind of the process because it the lengthy process does allow you to get things done right. You know, you're not in a rushed manner like some of these private industries are. You can really, you know, dial in into a design and not check all the boxes, but make sure, you know, everyone's thought of in the design process. I love the design aspect more than the government aspect. I find politics to be really dry, in my opinion. I, I love just designing things. I, As a kid, I used to play like city skylines and design cities on my own. And I would love to like work in particularly transport. Transportation is like public and like private transportation is something that really just interests me. And the design of making more efficient cities through transport I worked this summer in a position where I was required to, you know, arrange transportation a lot. And I really wanted to take that and just think of how I can apply that in the future because I really did enjoy what I did. And I've always been someone who loves designing things and putting aside the politics of things just to understand and be able to design things that people can use and just be able to, you know, work on projects where I can design and map out how a city is going to look in terms of transportation, or in terms of other things as well. I would love to, you know, expand my realm in that regard as well, because there is a really big field within urban planning about design. And I would love to take that and just grow a little bit more. So I would love to like maybe work as like a planner at TransLink someday and just really get to share my ideas and just learn how things are really done there and the processes. It'd be really exciting. Nice. Well, we need a bit of both, right? We need the process and we need the, and we need the design. So I guess since you've started, you know, urban planning or being in the field of urban planning or even participating as part of UBC capacity, have you ever had like a eureka moment where you feel like, oh, you're seeing, you know, a piece of the city in a different lens because you've you've learned something or you've appreciated something that has gone into into that landscape? I don't think it really happens in Vancouver as much as I hope, but whenever I go travel to a new city, I definitely like compare their city design to what we have in Vancouver and just after like learning about Vancouver's history and their urban planning history in classes whenever I go to a new city I'm like yeah that doesn't look right or this could be better or yeah Matthew maybe you've had a different experience but I def I'm definitely very nitpicky about that stuff now I guess you could say. No I've had a very similar experience I was actually in Copenhagen last week and just seeing the way they have like their public transit and their design of their city just really gave me so much inspiration for what Vancouver could be, but I know probably won't be ever. But, you know, it gives me that, that false hope. But I would say it definitely got me thinking about where things could definitely be improved realistically, where an extra bike lane could be, where, you know, an extra path or a park or any of these things that, you know, you see in another city just gives you inspiration. And I think as well as a kid, just I, I used to always love just reading and researching, just looking at maps and maps really taught me a very important thing about a city. And it's that you can visualize a city on a map. Or you can visualize a city on an application like City Skylines. But to get those things that you want, you really just have to make an effort to push them. And Dennis is doing that with movement and just trying to improve these things. And all these dreams or designs or all these things you have, you actually have to put it into a process to actually make change happen. I think that's really taught me like 
all these things that we want to do, we're doing our best at capacity to try to push them forward because we really want to spread the word and make really facilitate that change that we've all been talking about that, but has never really been done. Well, thank you, Matthew and Emma, for joining me today. Really enjoyed our discussion, really inspired by the energy that you guys have and all of the work you guys are doing with Capacity. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen, for having us. We really appreciate it. It's clear that Fern, Matthew, and Emma are passionate about improving their urban surroundings. While some of them are motivated by experience, such as negative impacts of poor transit, others are motivated by the opportunities to collaborate with other student departments to envision better urban environments. Everyone has a stake in how our cities are shaped, but not everyone might be participating in these conversations. As we've heard from today's guests, even younger generations are aware that the official channels for engaging with urban issues are often dry, complex, and difficult to access. Fern, Matthew, and Emma have shown that it's possible to actively engage through a variety of tools to reach a wider audience, both to learn and to share ideas. They bring a huge value to the conversation as the current and future residents in our cities, and they are already compiling complex ideas into inviting and interesting opportunities to engage with their community. I hope that we continue to hear from younger voices, and I invite you to engage with them. You've been listening to Urbanism Vancouver, the podcast dedicated to bettering our built environment. Be sure to follow us on your listening platform of choice so you don't miss our future releases. I'm Helen Loy. Thanks for listening. This podcast series was independently funded and produced by myself and Aaron Johnson. Visit us at urbanismvancouver.com.